So I'll go back to the first time we met, which was, uh, we actually, we didn't meet, but the first time I saw you was, we we're doing this show at the comic, this is like a comic book in East LA. And I, I was walking in, caught the last half of your set as you were leaving. And I was like, who is this? You're so funny. Mm. And then just so happened, like literally later that day, you're like, hey, you hit the comedy bunker to do the show. And I was like, this is perfect. I was going to hit you to do it. Was it the show? Was it the show at a sex shop? I think it was records or comic books or something. It was like. <gasps> yes, Sean. Sean, yeah, yeah, Sean. Sean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Man, that seems like so many lifetimes ago. Because that's when I was just, I was visiting LA a lot. Yeah. And I remember the first time I walked into the comedy bunker, I was like, whoa, it's such a cool, in a good way. Like, it's just such a cool setup. Like, it, I re really, really remember that because my girlfriend and I broke up, but I remember that was like one of the first shows she came with me to. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. And she was, yep. And she was like, wow, this is a show at someone's house. And I was like, this is not the normal setup for like, like don't set this as the bar. Cause I've never seen a show at someone's house like this. Yeah. It's a, such a cool space. It reminds me of the village underground. If you just kind of compressed yes. it into a small, like it has that same two tone thing. Look at the wood at the bottom yes. brick on top. It just like, um, when I saw the space, I'm like, can I do a show here? And they're like, okay, I guess figure it out. And yeah, it's been going strong up until COVID. Right. With a couple outdoors, which were cool. It's, you know, we all do the best we can with the outdoor shows. Right. But um, yeah, since then you did the Comedy Bunker a few times and then we ran into each yes. other in New York. Uh, I kind of came around with you to the cellar and watched you do your set there. When was that? That was around the time of Skank Fest 2019. Wow. That's crazy. Because I'm, tr okay, so there's a real reason that I've been really trying to um, piece timelines together for a very brutal reason that sucks. I got audited for 2018 and 2019. Oh no. Yeah. And so then the IRS, like, audit, I don't know why, why I'm the one to, I had not tried to cut any corners. Like I wouldn't even know what to, if I did know how to do that, I would have, but I don't. So I got audited and they want to, the last conversation, they were like, we need a detailed timeline of your traveling. So I have to go through and piece together where the, fuck I was and I have no idea so now I'm okay so good to know all right that's good to, that's good yeah to yeah is, together. is it one of those because like as a touring comedian there's different tax laws for different states is it one of those situations it's that and then also I had gone real heavy with the tax write-offs in 2019 okay. in 2018 also I was working in 2018 and 2019 I was filming Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which we filmed in LA mm -hmm. and I lived in New York. So there was, I think that's what the the flag was, but I also have ADHD and I'm super disorganized, which I take total responsibility for. But them being like, we need a detailed travelogue. I was like, oh, just arrest me. Just take me in right now. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm ready to go like there's this isn't i don't know how this is going to work right but i do remember that i didn't realize it was 2019 because i don't know time but it I is one of those that. things as like when you come to la to do work especially on like a show you know you're getting california you get payroll in california so if you live yes. in a different state they're gonna automatically just be like all right are you here more than 181 days ish to make sure you're not a resident and all those things and it gets right. complicated like it's a lot so of, complicated and like no one really know. I mean, I sure as hell, I'm not a tax attorney by any means or. Yeah. I have no idea. I'm like, I, uh, I don't, because also I was traveling a lot too. So I have no, I'm surprised that the IRS was paying attention and this is what they're, that I'm where they want to spend their time. But I've been going, through, I was going doing that this morning, actually like going through and being like, okay, 2019 where, what the fuck, what yeah. happened? But do you keep all your dates in your, you must have a calendar, right? So a little bit, you know, <laughs> now that you mentioned it, that is a good idea. I've, I do have a calendar. I do have a calendar with where I'll be like, if it's a club date, then the club date goes on that and the travel for that goes there. Other than that, it's the wild west. I keep it in my phone. I keep two different calendars on my phone. Now things have changed. Now I do a, a very specific calendar where it's like, okay, this is personal stuff, professional stuff, and they're all color coded. Yeah. But that has only been going on for two months. So 
2018, 2019 didn't have a system. I had the various calendars and notepads where I would scribble things on. Yeah, you can bet every all the rich people who moved to Austin, they have a detailed, probably one person just doing their calendar, oh. making sure that they don't cross the, the date Absolutely. threshold. Yeah, like not one afternoon of, and then be going between New York and LA anyway, so it's not like I'm doing it in some place where I would be saving money on taxes. Although I did try to do that with Vegas. For a minute, I was like, I should just move to Vegas because I was there a week out of every month, but then it didn't didn't quite add up. Yeah, that's a lot of Vegas. You could hang out with Brian Regan, but it's a lot of Vegas. It's a lot of Vegas. I really wouldn't want to live in... There's no taxes for a reason. Right, right, right. You got to draw people. Um, that's right. that's awesome. So New York, you feel like the New York scene is coming back and it feels like uh, it's getting a little bit back to normal? I feel like the New York scene is strongly coming back i remember when it was in december i guess like i would see the same maybe 15 people out and they would be we would they would be out like i remember there's a comedian Derek Gaines, and i remember i, love seeing Derek, him. Yeah. I would see him yeah super great guy and i would see him all over the place and then there was this one show out in bushwick and it was so fucking cold like it was just and i knew he was on the flyer but i hadn't seen him show up yet and i was like i hope he doesn't show up because it was so cold there's only like three audience members there it was near a train track like it was so brutal and then he showed up and I was I was like leaving and I was like what are we doing and he was like I don't know this is like that intense compulsion amongst comedians was still very much happening even in the worst elements so now that those elements are more conducive to actually like good stand up happening. It's back, but I don't, there's, it definitely feels like it feels different because it feels like, I mean, up until recently, we still had the curfew. So it, yeah. it felt like people aren't like running around, which I actually think is great. Like, I know this sound is like kind of fucked up, but some part of me really liked that 11 o'clock curfew. Yeah, it's because you can't be, there's no FOMO. You're not missing out. There's no spots. FOMO. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And FOMO is the fucking bitch of it all. Like, it doesn't in New York. I'll get this the stand up FOMO, which is so insane because it's like you could do plenty of shows, but then if you're not doing shows past eleven, and you know someone is, then you get FOMO of that. And it's like, okay, well, what did you do on your earlier shows? Did you do new jokes? Have you been listening to recordings? No, and no. So you just want to be out to be out because someone else says like it doesn't even. It's not log. It's not logical at all. No, even our Instagram feeds are kind of in a way just like intra comedian FOMO machines. Like, you know, how many comedians you totally. follow a lot? How many comedians follow you? And we watch each other get shows or not get shows and get things. And, and yeah. you're like, this is a little bit weird. Well, I'll tell you what I did during COVID. Went through, and if it's com- I went through and I unfollowed. It's comedians that are much like just comedians that I would be very like famous ones. And I went through and unfollowed almost all of them. So all the famous ones. Pretty much. Yeah. Nice. Why? Well, yeah. Nice. I was, Take one, that. I was one of them. So I'm glad I'm in the famous group. Did I unfollow you? <laughs> I'm just playing. Did yeah, you did, but it's, I, I don't care. Oh, really? It's totally fine. Yeah. I went through a sweep and was just unfollowing so many. Well, I've done it. I've We've all done, all done it. You got to go through a purge. You're like, yeah. boom, 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 boom. And uh, you can always add them back later. I'm not one of those people. Yeah. Like, I, Oh my God, you unfollowed me. Oh, that's so funny. You're the first person who said, because I got, um, I was like pretty trigger happy with it. I'll tell you that, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. must have just been going through and done it. So my bad, I'll, I'll re, I'll, I'll refollow you. No, 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 please don't. You're not triggering to me in any way. It was like, <laughs> I remember doing it. I remember there was a couple of days where I was just like on the couch in LA and I was like, you know what? I'm going to set myself up for when COVID comes back. No. And I just was like unfollowing comedians yeah yeah no I, I yeah i feel that way all the time i mean i sometimes i see the people who follow like zero people like aziz and sorry and i'm like oh i, I want to be that one day just be like zero i'm done zero yeah. so he opens up his page and there's just nothing he probably doesn't check it i don't i mean i don't know him but like it's uh yeah that's bold. See, it seems liberating that's a statement it does but i also like i also do like seeing what people are doing too it's just having self-control where it gets hard it gets harder and harder. Like it gets, it's trickier. Yeah. It is nice sometimes. Cause you're like, Oh, I should do that too. Or like, I should apply yes. for this one thing or like, do yes. it can rejog your memory to be like, Oh wait, wait, I forgot about that thing. Absolutely. And that, that is actually something that I think 
where because I do think of like okay compare and despair comparing yourself to people is bad but I think when you look at something someone is doing and you use it to motivate you in a way that isn't just making you spin your wheels I think that that's really good like that's definitely pushed me to try to do stuff before by being like oh this person's doing that like I respect them or and but I feel like I could throw my hat in that ring in that case yeah when you see someone with the same skill set or like the same it's this same lane you're like oh i could do that thing too yeah that is very yep. that could, that's the healthy side of it that's the healthy side of it and then the unhealthy side is being like thinking that someone's like out to get you or trick you and things are unfair i mean that is something you have no control over yeah and that's but all being like oh yeah yeah that's like the internal monologue that we all have that like it can be i guess depending on the day healthy or not healthy and also it's such a, like, it's such a self, for, just being for myself, it's such a self-involved thing for me to think that like things are stacked against me. Like, guess what? No one gives a fuck about, it's like, no one cares. Like yeah. they, not only are things not stacked against you, someone's not spending the time to be like, let me set this up. So Emma Willman doesn't, or does get this. It's like, it's, there's a lot more going on than whatever you're doing. Yeah, I think that's one of the things in like the secrets book or some book where it's like, yeah, don't yeah, like assume those. that like people are having malicious intent. They're just not thinking about you. <laughs> like you Absolutely. said. Absolutely. I mean, how many times totally. like I've done a set so many times in front of like other comedians I know and I'm like, fuck, they're gonna hear the same joke I just did. Oh yeah. And then they get oh. off I get off stage, they're like, dude, I've never heard that one before. I'm like, I know I've done this in front of you like at least ten times. And right. that just goes to show like how not important or not not important but like they have other stuff going on they're not paying attention to every totally joke. i think that when i see certain comedians like all the time and that will be like i'll be i'll be like ah fuck like they're gonna see the same shit and they're gonna think i don't write fast enough but i do try to write a lot but it's really really hard i don't translate it over and blah blah and then they get up and they do their same jokes and like i could give two flying fucks i'm like who cares yeah, yeah, and yeah then when i see a comedian do their same jokes i'm like good for them for doing the same jokes you like or they'll do it'll be the same amount like of new ones and old ones that I was doing too and I'll be like oh okay you know cool whatever but exactly. I do think that I get worried about new jokes a lot totally well since we're talking about Instagram and social media do you think you can still be a comedian that's not focused on the internet like who, who's just doing it for the and jokes I think about that all the fucking time because I wonder so much about like things change so rapidly. I feel like in the, it was even in, I, I could be wrong in this timeline too, but I feel like it was like, so I'd be curious what you think of this. I feel like it was really the past four years where I, like it used to be like, yeah, that's awesome. If you do that, that's great. But then something happened in the past four years where it's like, it just bring, gains so much momentum and it makes sense. It's like, okay, it's about being a draw and selling tickets. And that's a way to direct to consumer direct to do that. But for someone to, I don't, I really don't know. Cause it's like, maybe there is, but I wouldn't know about it because they're not telling me about it online. Yeah. So that's true. Yeah. You know, like there is like Brian Regan isn't getting his draw from Instagram or online and neither is someone like Sebastian Maniscalco, even though he's very active yeah. on line, but it's, but that's also like, okay, but what about like, as we're, as time is going by, like newer people, I don't know. Cause like, like Gerard Carmichael wasn't on social media platforms, but now I don't think he does comedy anymore. Right. But these are all like people who kind of made it before yes. they became a thing. Like right. I look at someone so like now, Daniel, know. you know, Daniel Simonson. I love that guy. He's so funny. And he's so funny. And like, but I don't see him doing a lot. Of, and this is not a diss at all, but he seems of to course. be someone doing it the old way in a way, like doing right. it based on being the funniest guy. And right. I look at the, I look at him. I'm like, oh, it is possible. Right. Yeah. See, I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea because then I guess it. I guess one, it might maybe depends what you want to do. Like maybe it's like, but it makes maybe not doing any social media will become almost a novelty, right. and so then that will get scooped up. But it's so hard too because there's so many platforms out there. So say someone does a special or a late night set or even a TV show. It all kind of, like Jermaine Fowler. I'll think about him because he's not always on social media, but he's done a TV show and he's in coming to America. Yeah. And I remember always seeing him around in New York and I'll just, to me, I kind of like look at his page, but then it's like, I remember knowing Tiffany Haddish before she popped off and right. like meeting her and she had a 
you know, she was kind of active on it, about as active as Jermaine is, and then all of a sudden it's, it just blows up. So I don't know. But now she's active on it. Yeah, they have that. They had that Hollywood. It's all for, we're all doing it for draw. Like, let's be honest, like we're doing social sure. media for draw an audience and they have audience yes. that's built in through Hollywood. So Jermaine had right. crashing and other acting stuff coming to America. Like you said, Tiffany right. blew up in movies, which kind of it's like that cycle of reinforcing her draw. So uh, then she did social media, too. So she looped it around. So yeah, it's like exactly her draw. Everything fed the other thing. But then with Jermaine, I don't know if he's on Instagram as much. I have I was just. I don't know if I follow him anymore. I have to check. I I, <laughs> I have to check. I really did a comedian yeah, turn. No, it's, I get it. Yeah. Now it's, I got to stick my head back and be like, boop, boop, go follow again. Right. Just have one app that undo, undoes that one day on the couch. Yeah. Whoops. Yeah. But it is something I think about a lot. And I think we're all trying to struggle with because you see the people also transitioning into stand up adjacent stuff, like doing sure. funny sketches. And then that kind of like in if they're already a funny stand-up and they're doing sketches, now they're getting more algorithm hits, which is increasing yes. their draw. And it's like, it's, it kind of throws us at added pressure to be like, should I be doing that too? Right. And then also figuring out what, cause I was thinking so much about social media. I was like, okay, I just, I'm going to focus on Instagram. not even saying I, I, cause if I start thinking about TikTok and Facebook and Clubhouse. the ones I don't even know, Twitter clubhouse, clubhouse, I did not get. Are you on Clubhouse? I am. I, I did my first Clubhouse show. I'm like, this is going to be weird. How and was it? It was, it was great. Honestly, I would put it as a little bit more fun than a Zoom show. It's weird because really? you're walking around the, the place with like, your phone and you're doing jokes and you're like, and they're laughing. Like the, the, there's no delay. And you can't see them. You can't see them. You just hear people. Hmm. It's like doing it on speakerphone. It was surprisingly good. I was at the. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't mind after a while getting in the rhythm of the Zoom shows. I was like, did not like. I was happy to do them. I like. I had fun doing them, but I did do ones where there were no sound, and that's where I. I would much rather have sound than visual. So maybe with Clubhouse, I would. I don't know now since there are live shows in New York. I'm not doing the online ones. Yeah. Anymore. I keep thinking I've done my last Zoom show, and then you'll get one more. You're like, all right. Yeah. So I was like, that's it. I'm not doing any more. And then I got out. I, there was one that was like, it's just do five minutes. And it was a benefit. So I was like, I'll do it. And I was like coming back into my apartment. And I was like, oh, shit. I remember to remember. I'm like logging in maybe five minutes before I'm supposed to go on logging in. And I didn't realize that the entire audience was muted. And I remember I'd had like a really good show the night before, like live. And then I like log in and I'm in. It. No, I was doing more than five minutes. I think I was doing 15, like like maybe five minutes into it, I started being like, whoa, I am getting, I am bombing. So about 10 minutes into it, I started being like sweating. And then when they called it, the comedian that went on next was like, okay, everybody needs to unmute at least, or at least two people. But since I hadn't logged in before my set, I didn't know that it was, everyone was muted. And then that, I was like, that's it. I can't have any more Zoom shows because that was not good for my head. Yeah. You did nail it, though, because when you said you're like, oh, the Zoom shows that are not you can't hear are worse than when you can't see. And that's what's good about mm. Clubhouse is that you hear everyone. And like I think the show I was doing, there was 400 people. So it's like you're going really? to hear people laugh. You're going to hear someone. Someone is going to have their mic on out of 400, right. like enough where you're like, right. oh, you can get some reaction. And it's all about reaction, right? Other a hundred percent. I joined, Cl I did join Clubhouse, but um, for some reason it kept on turning on. Like it would be in my pocket and all of a sudden I'd have all these voices coming out of my pocket. <laughs> so I'd be like, what the fuck? And then it would be like, leave silently or however they phrase it when you leave it. So I just, I took the app off because I kept on bopping it and it was like creeping me out. Yeah. So if I have 400 people listening to you on the subway. Like shuffling around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. yeah. Um, but since we talked about also like you coming out to LA and stuff for a crazy mm -hmm. ex-girlfriend and actually, yeah, Danny Jollis, so I recently had in the pod. I love him. Okay. So that's, and Danny was who went on after me at, at that show. And oh, he was that's like, the one. I'm not go yeah. He was like, I'm not going down like that. And he was like, also that was so tricky because they did unmute themselves when they brought me up. Uh, so that's also why I was so confused. Like they unmuted and were like, welcome Emma Wilman. And then they were like, clap, clap, clap. Like, and then they remuted themselves. And he was like, I saw that happen. And he was so, he handled it so, so well. Like he was like, you know how he handled it well too? He had self-respect in it. Like he, he was like, okay, 
someone needs to unmute or this is you got to get he's like if you i'm totally pair botching it and paraphrasing but he was like if you guys don't laugh that's fine i want to earn it but give me a shot here unmute and i thought that was like very good a good way for him to do that he's doing the digital version of re-hosting like the, the host right, who didn't exactly. host and bring the room in he's going yes. back and doing that digitally <laughs> exactly so funny but I bring that up because we're talking about like the LA, New York and, you mm -hmm. know, like I would do the opposite of you. I'd go to New York every year. And now I feel weird even doing it because I'm like, am I really going to hit up people in New York who's the locals <laughs> haven't had a chance to get on stage and be like, can I get a spot? And maybe that's my own internal, like, you being know, what? too nice Fuck or whatever. Them. But yeah, nope. If you can swing it and do it and it's more productive to come out here because there's more stage time, go for it. Because who knows if people I, i'll think of it like this sometimes it's like it's so important to be polite it is really important to be a good person but really do what you need to do and one of the things with entertainment is like we all put ourselves in this situation so if someone is like that person is looking out for themselves it's like yeah okay <laughs> and and yeah because it's like it's like we all walked into a sex dungeon so we can't complain if someone's getting smacked because it's like well you can walk out yeah, so yeah. like go to I don't know. I've never been in an actual sex dungeon, but I'm assuming they're smacking each other. Right. Whip something. Yeah. Whip something. Yeah. But I feel like if you want to go to New York, like that is really nice and considerate of you for sure. But if you want to go and get the stage time, fucking go for it. And then from your perspective, are you still going to be coming to LA and kind of doing that by coastal thing or is it changing? So I went back to LA. Mm, I went back to LA cause I was dating. I was, I'm seeing someone that lives in LA, but she's moving back to New York. Nice. So I went out to, and I had to get stuff out of storage, but show wise, I don't have any plans to go back to LA because it doesn't like just work like money wise. There's no, it, I can't think of a really good excuse for me to do it. And I, so I was like, okay, just, I need to like stay put in New York unless I have at least for a little bit. And then unless I can go out where it's because any meeting is over zoom. Right. So I had been pitching something that's all over zoom. I do really think it's important to be going back out, but it's like in an ideal world, I would like to go out like every six weeks, but I'm going to stay put in New York. I'm going to try to stay and not go out to LA until like August. And then I would like to go out for like 10 days and do shows. And I think it's so valuable to like be on, just be on people's podcasts and like see what people are up to. And I also like, I, I like LA more than New York. Oh, personally. really? Yeah. I love, I fucking, I love the palm trees. I love the hiking. I like the, I like cafe gratitude that like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. She, she crystals. I like that stuff. That's it's how they just get that you. In New York, it's how they get you. And yeah. I like it. But in New York, I felt, I feel like I can, I just have more control because I can do more comedy and like, I feel like that's how I can get traction. Yeah. It is surprising. There is like a, a ton of shows right now, but they're like the, in LA. Yeah. The volume is outside oh, of the club. Like the clubs are just coming mm. back now, but like, there's so like the outdoor show has really picked up the slack and there's so many good ones. That's great. Now. Maybe I will come out that. Maybe I'll come out a little bit sooner. All right. Yeah. Come. Yeah. Put just like keep getting a storage locker and putting something in it. So you're like, I gotta go. Yeah, I got, yeah. It's like the leaving something at yeah. someone's house. Right, exactly. They're like, you're just moving the same toothbrush in and out of storage. You can take it with you and I'll be like, back off. I got other, I got, I'm on an agenda. Yeah. Trying to make it in show business. I'm traumatized because the place I used to stay at in New York, which is actually the original apartment I used to live in when I lived there, was like, mm. my friend who she's had it so many years, it was rent controlled in East Village. Like, it was no rent. And I always had this dream, nice. like, one day if she ever gets rid of it, I'll take it. And then she goes, oh, I got rid of it. I was like, God damn it. Why? Because she wanted to leave? Uh, she, you know, she, she was part of the New York exodus. She went upstate. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I could, because when I was, I think if I had stayed in New York for all of this, I would have gone bonkers because I stayed one night in my apartment when I came, I had my apartment here, I was airbnb it. And I came back to, like, pack it up. And I stayed no, maybe it was like three nights, but I got tested and all that stuff. But there was three, I was like, did the quarantine for three days in New York and I was going bonkers being in a studio. Yeah. So I could not imagine doing it for months on end. Ooh. I would have bounced, I think. Yeah, I think that's 
probably why a lot of people did. Well, well, if you ever come out here, we can we can swap. You can have my house, and we'll do a Great. little, little, little switcheroo. Sounds awesome. I got a really cute place on the Lower East Side. I'm really. It was coming and looking at apartments now in New York where it wasn't like a rushed thing because I was trying to decide between moving back to LA or New York, and I knew New York would make a, a little bit more sense for me career wise. I just felt like just being able to just do more stand up then but looking at apartments here it was like boy you felt like the the king of town because it would just be you and they obviously were just catering to you so that felt that was lovely yeah i saw like i was looking just for fun i saw something on central park west it was like look oh park view i think it was a one bedroom it was like 2500 a month i was like hell yeah what the hell is happening right and then you forget that that still is a lot of money because, but it's because it's New York. So you're like, oh my God, it's free. Yeah, that, it's, that's it's, what yeah, I was it's free. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, whoa, these apartments are so cheap. It's only two thousand four hundred dollars. It's only two, it's one thousand eight hundred. That's nothing. It's that's so cheap. But then it's like that actually is still expensive for most places. But it's just not what you're used to in New York. Because I was looking at places like, oh my God, these deals are insane. Yeah. And I kept bumping up what I was looking at, and then it was like, okay, do, you don't. Yeah, but you also, like in the financial district, I started like really looking at places around there. And if you bumped it up, like if you were willing to spend $3,000 a month, you could live in the sickest apartment. There was one I looked at that had, but I don't need, I was 3000 was more than what my budget was. I just right. kept on bumping it up because it was like, there was this one I looked at where they gave you six months free. That was the most extreme deal I what? saw. And then it came out to $3,000 a month with the six months free. Mm. But... Then after those, that year lease is up, yeah, like, what reset. are you going to do? Oh, and, yeah. Six grand right. a month or whatever. Yeah. Right. And that was like way, that was much more than I was like looking to spend anyway. So I, it was fun to do, but it was also like, okay, it's still New York. My, and my, my place now is very cute and it was easy to get, which was, that was nice. The other thing too, is like, you know, once the pandemic will end, and the second right. that ends, that they'll oh. be like, oh, we're resetting to real rates. And then you'll be yeah, screwed. Yeah, get the fuck out of here. And you're like, but I was stuck with you in the bad times. See, they're looking out for themselves. For oh, sure, yeah. they're not going to give a fuck. Absolutely. Um, I was listening to the last episode of your uh, Emma's Diaries. Mm. And it was it quite a while ago. I haven't updated it in a long time. It was, yeah, it was December. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. And I wanted to talk to you about like your perspective of like, uh, I guess altering uh course with different podcasts and starting multiple podcasts. Mm -hmm. Like, cause that's something I think about a lot. It's like when you see things moving and you get trends of like, okay, the listeners going up and as an interview podcast, the interview podcast style is very guest dependent. So if I have a big sure. guest, it gets a lot. If I get a regular guest, it gets in the middle. And then when you do a solo podcast, like I was listening to yours, it's like, Oh, you build real fans that like come for you only. I wanted to get your perspective on that to see if you agree and if that's part of your strategy for changing the formats. So I, when I did the diary, the diary was I, this really short form concept that I started doing. I do a once a week, I'll be a co-host on a show called the Taylor Strucker show. And it's behind a paywall. She used to be on Sirius. Now she does it but on Patreon. And I would, I used it as something where I would talk about it on Taylor's show and then I would just set, put the link up and like, that's who would listen to it. it would be people from her show. But I wasn't like putting it on Instagram or Facebook. And the reason was, is I didn't want the pressure of editing it really well or promoting it really well. And so I just wanted to set it up. Like, this is just a little diary where I'm going to talk for like five to 20 minutes about who fucking knows what. Yeah. And it was really fun to do. And then I, over quarantine, I started doing an interview based one and that one was fun too, but it, that was definitely... I was putting a lot of pressure on myself about editing and trying to, you know, s just start at the finish line basically. And right. that I enjoy doing the diary so much more. And I haven't up, the reason I haven't updated that in a long time is actually, I think it was, I think it was just like, I needed to regroup because I was putting so much pressure on myself with podcasting. And then also the breakup, I was like, it made me be like, you know, podcast, it can be so personal and especially the diary. Like it really was like my diary. So I was like, okay, I want to, I want to rethink about what I put out there a little bit. I'm still going to put the same amount of stuff out there, but I just hadn't been keeping up with the, 
keeping up with the diary. I was just thinking about that the other day, actually. And solo podcasting, if you're doing it for more than 20 minutes, it's a it's an interesting muscle. But most of the people with the solo podcast have a producer in the room, and that makes a big difference. Yeah, because you're not doing it. You just have a silent person who's not contrib- – it's like you have one audience. You have one audience. So at least, even with your pausing or anything, if at any time you can like look over and they do a little something, something – just something that is a buffer between you being alone in a room, just talking to yourself really helps. Yeah. Like I Tim thought. Dillon's like with his, uh, exactly. He's a the guy there who, who like, he'll talk like once every hour and it, but it's that enough. guy's amazing. <laughs> oh, it's so good. That guy watching that guy laugh is I love watching his, I love watching his face. And I like watching when like Tim looks at him for his reaction a little bit. I, I love what I love the way the two of them like look together. Yeah. I love it also because one camera and it works I know. like totally works that is totally works. just like you're saying like i'd love to have the getting rid of the pressure el- editing element is so important because you, yes. you turn it on and it's like it's happening and you can get rid of that different ways you can have someone do it for you or you just design a style that's very easy and inviting i'm sure for them they like mm-hmm. set up a camera like let's go they're not it's not stressful or maybe it is right. i don't know yeah they're like stressed out of their fucking minds and they just like make it look easy so then we're like wow how easy is that? And then they're like working around the clock yeah. to make it look easy. I mean, it's not easy but, to be a great broadcast. He's a, he's a broadcaster. Like he has that broadcast yes. thing. Totally. Which is, I've kn- I knew Tim when he was in New York and it was cool to see that side of him. It was like a very like natural fit. And there, I was watching something where Ryan Felipe was talking about Tim Dillon. And I was like, God, entertainment is I, cause I also like love entertainment. So like something like that is like makes more, I'm like, entertainment is awesome. Yeah. That fucking Ryan Felipe, what, I think he was just talking about what podcast he listened to was talking about Tim Dillon or like going to his house for Christmas, something very strange, but also not strange. Yeah. I think he mentioned that like Ryan came to his party or something because of that. And like, it is interesting because I'm sure to them, like a level ish actors, they're like, what is this sure. world that I'm not a part of? Right. Like, and right. They're, they're trying right. to get into it. And we're like, hey, can I be in your next movie A-list? Right. And so we're all trying to like meld like, worlds. No. Yeah. But it's like, there's all these different gates and different gatekeepers in the whole thing. And then an actor is going to have much less leverage, no matter how famous they are, to put you in a movie. Because oh, yeah, no matter what, yeah. that's just like so not what they would be doing unless they're making the movie. Yeah. That's what's kind of nice because... I'm sure, as a comedian, people always ask you to do things for them. Right. True. <laughs> like uh, true, and it's it's like this is who you want to ask to do stuff for you, comedians. All right. Yeah, I guess because we because it's such a people oriented and like uh, I mean it's not necessarily flat, but like a new comedian can be next to like the best comedian on a lineup sure. pretty early in their career. Which doesn't really happen Absolutely. as much in acting. Like there's a there's a bit of a longer path. Absolutely. You know who I saw the other night? Um, I think it was not this Friday, the Friday night before. Sebastian Maniscalco and Ray Romano were at the cellar, and so I was sitting next to Sebastian because he came, they're doing shows upstairs at the cellar now. So I was sitting there, and then he came in and he sat back where the table was, but now the table is different because they're doing shows up there. So I was sitting next to him. And then I saw the Booker SC come in with the owner and they were with Ray Romano. And it's just like that wouldn't have happened on an acting set. Like they would have had their own separate space. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. They wouldn't have been squished in at the the table. And, you know, Sebastian, I'm like moving my coffee cups so, so he can sit down comfortably. Like, but I love that about comedy. Yeah, I, I like that the audience knows a bit more for se- whatever reason in comedy to not be so weird and not be yeah. so fan oriented. Like, I mean, with an AA level comedian, you're going to get some autographs and stuff like that. Sure. But like, generally, they're pretty respectful. Even at like, e- you know, in a store where like everyone's smashed into each other, right. it's like they're pretty respectful. You know who I've seen people really fan out for, though, is Sal from Impractical Jokers. Really? Like, if he's standing somewhere, people will be like, like, oh, oh, hey. And then maybe it's because they know him from TV more. And he's so nice. Like, he'll always be like, okay, after the show or just not right now or yes or whatever it is. But if people, like, if he catches their eye, then they'll be like, oh, and kind of. Yeah, that's that, that TV fame is different. It's like, uh, yeah. I, I can't miss this. Right, right. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, and then I saw Impractical Jokers for the first time and was like, I think I saw it maybe two years after I knew him and from, just from comedy. And I was like, oh shit, this show's awesome. And so then like when I'd see him, I'd be like, I'd like almost like look at him differently because I'd been watching him on TV and it just right. makes, it's just a very weird like mental thing once you've like been watching someone on TV and then seeing them right in front of you. Yeah, then you're doing that as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what's one thing you invested in, in terms of your career where you're like, you took the time to invest in this one thing and it really paid off and it doesn't need to be monetary. It can be like, um, time wise or decision based. Oh, I'll tell you exactly two things that come to mind right away. The first one, this is going to sound really obvious, but I remember it was just getting a really professional looking website when I first started. That's less important now. I probably, cause of, you know, social media is more important, but I remember that helped me get my first college agent oh, because nice. he was asked if I had a website and then he was like, Oh, your website's so fun. You look really fun in this. This will help us get college shows. And then starting to get college shows was what helped me get an agent and a manager and do doing stand up full time. Cause I was doing colleges, but I specifically remember being like, should I do this with the website and then doing it and him being like, Oh, perfect. Like haven't even watched your stuff yet, but like you look really cool on this website. Yeah. Which is insane. That is That's insane. totally nuts. So nuts. He was like, you got a good look. I, I like this website. Yeah. And then the other thing, it's just gritting my teeth and doing acting classes because it's Yes. Brutal. It's the worst. It's so brutal. And I did and I did acting classes. I did two of them over COVID. And then I was just working with I work with this acting coach. There's a comedian named Bill Dawes. And when I get an audition and I work with Bill, work with Bill. And just wasn't getting anything. And then I got cast in an episode, guest star episode of The Good Fight last month. And I haven't nice. been cast Congratulations. in two years. Yeah. Thank you. And I was like, it was 100% the acting class and working with Bill. One, there's no, because I had to like fake laugh at it and get in a fight in the scene. And it was 100% because of that. But it was just such like a, getting, working on acting, it's such a slow, tedious process. So I felt like proud of myself that I kept doing it, even though I, you know, it's not my favorite thing yeah. in the world. It is so important. Like I took an acting class out here in LA and it brutal. Helped, it's brutal, but it helps you so much. Cause you're like, Oh, yeah. you understand. You're like, Oh wow. There's a lot of work into this. You understand how to yeah. dissect the script, but it helped my stand up yes. too. It helped me be a bit more uh, present and a bit more like, sure. in it. and 100%. I got one bit out of, from doing the acting class, which is probably the most important priceless. thing. <laughs> yeah. Priceless, priceless. I would do more acting classes if I felt like I'd get material from it, actually. Then I would definitely, and so if you're in a class, you kind of have an audience of the class. So, you yeah. know, there's ways to make it productive too, but oof, they are tough, I think. I did, unfortunately, see my acting teacher do stand up. And oh no, why? It why? was not good. And it ruined the Why entire. Why did they do that? It ruined it for me because I'm like, yeah. it's like seeing your someone you look up to oh. just, and then you look, not down on them, but you're like, oh my God. There's something about it. And I don't, I would have the exact same reaction. Like, it's like, it's something just so like, oh, if dirty is not the right word, but it's just something where you're like, it's like a neuroses or psychosis that we, we know so well because we live it and are it. So then when you see someone that you didn't think was like also that way, you're like, ah, yeah. It, what? It just, I don't know what it is, but it really, really taints the makes me i love comedians but then also like if i saw someone like that too because also i'd be like what are you doing like do you really want to do this like why why are you what's going on yeah and the student the acting student acting teacher relationship is yes. such a pedestal it's like absolutely come come like bask in my knowledge and like it's so personal like telling you you're not doing it right or you could be doing it better sure. and like breaking you down and so it's like there's a lot of reverence to that person and when you see yes. them like, it's like seeing them trip and fall at the grocery store. You're like, oh, no. Yeah. I remember taking a comedy class in Boston when I started. And then, and I just remember for like years, I thought that got, the teacher of the class was a famous person just because he taught the class. So in my mind, I was, and he's a great guy, awesome teacher. But I remember just, there was nothing you could do to convince me that he wasn't like just a superstar. It'd be just by virtue. So once someone's like in that slot as a teacher for in entertainment to you, then you, you really place them very highly. Yeah, it's the same feeling when, of, when you're starting. Yeah, it's the same when you're in elementary school and you see your teacher for the first right. time outside of school. You're like, you're what? Like, what? You're like stone faced. Yeah. You're like I can't believe it. Right. Yeah. I you, you go lived. to the grocery store like you don't. 
You yeah. have a servant do that for you? Right. Or you see him drunk at a bar. Um, right. What's the uh, final question? What's the uh, opposite of that? What's one thing you said, I'm going to take the time to invest in this one thing, and you found out for whatever reason it wasn't for you? Okay. I've got two answers for that, too. One okay. of them is, like, the really clear one because it was, like, very – so I signed up for um, I signed up for a improv class at UCB. Okay. And it it was really hard to get into it because it would fill up right away. So I I remember like really like waiting to try to get into the class, and right away the class would fill up. This is when UCB was like really quote unquote the hot. Top. Yeah. And I remembered having an agent try to get me in. I was like, could you try to get me in? And he was like, I made a call for you that they, they wouldn't take the call. They said they you have to do it yourself. And I was like, the guy was like pulling out all the stops. So finally. I get into this class and I had taken a sketch writing class that I really enjoyed, but I got into the improv class and I remember, I think it was the second class. I just hated it. And I, I just right away just dropped out cause I just didn't like the class. And I do, I kind of wish that I had stuck with it, but whew, I was like, I had spent a lot of time like trying, like researching it and like trying to get into the class. I paid for it. I didn't get yeah, the money yeah, back. Yeah. And then but I also think I spent too much time. I feel like I sometimes I've spent too much time like pushing it with things where it's like, hey, like just focus on trying to like do the work and getting better. And then those things like I was like so pushing, trying to get I remember like I was like trying to get into just for laughs, like do like way before I was even mildly ready. And I would like be like so torn up about not getting an audition for it or something when I. Like after doing stand up for like, I don't know, like six yeah. months, I'd be like, I need to get to the last. So, like, I'll look back on certain things and be like, I wish I had chilled out right. and not focused on that so much when, it, you know, that stuff can come and you can push yourself to try to do that. But, you know, doesn't need to be like your center. It doesn't need to like tear you up at night. Totally. One sec. I'm sorry. Someone's just banging on my door. So sorry. FedEx, they would not let up. I'm like, just okay. go away. Um, oh my god! I get my I had to um, disassemble my door, like the thing that lets me know when someone's at the front door, because I kept getting buzzes for it. Yeah, and it was driving me nuts. Yeah, I'm like leave it. It's 2020. I mean, yeah, or 2021. Right. Like you just leave the package. If it gets stolen, right, Amazon right. pays for it or something. I don't know what happens. Right. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, Emma Wil Wilman, this has been so fun. I really enjoyed talking Thank with you. you. Um, where do people Absolutely. find you? Give us your socials, your medias, all that. Emma Wilman, two L's and two N's on Instagram and TikTok. And you know what? Maybe I'll be on Clubhouse someday, but I really think there's something about, I'm just trying not to get overwhelmed and stick into it with Instagram and um, TikTok a little bit. And I try to stay pretty active on there. And then I'll be in an upcoming episode of The Good Fight. Yes. I think in three weeks on Paramount Plus. And I have to say, I learned something about regular stock investing from you because I didn't know IHOP and what was it? Not TJ for IHOP and Applebee's is the same company. So it I, is. I learned about and his revenues. Are, I listened to her pods. If you want to check that out. That's so, that's so, <laughs> it's so funny when, and if, if someone listens to the diary, then they like, and they bring something up. I'm like, how did you, how did you hear that? And they're like, I listened to your fucking diary. You idiot. You put it out there. But yes, I, I'm glad you learned something. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thanks again. And we'll talk to you soon. Sounds great.